special announcement here. We at the Business of Architecture love to help you win more great clients and projects. And we're offering a very special 45-minute one-on-one breakthrough session with one of our senior members which is a 45 minute call. And in this session, we're gonna help you map out a simple action plan. And this is gonna be based and, uh, on, on experience of working with hundreds of architects and helping them increase their income and the quality of projects. And it will be tailored to you depending on your budget and your goals, and of course, your ability to be able to implement. So we love helping architects and we wanna help you attract and win more better opportunities for your practice. So that is the one-on-one session. It's a free session, uh, but in order to be able to qualify to have one of these sessions, we do require some certain criteria. And the first of those is that you are the owner, partner, or main decision maker for an architecture, for your architecture practice or a architecture practice. You must be able to have the ability to provide exceptional service and results for your clients. And you must be targeting at least a further £100,000 in additional revenue for your practice. So if that sounds like you and you want to speak to one of our senior advisors and jump on one of those breakthrough session phone calls, click on the link that's in the information and we look forward to speaking to you. I think the first thing is is to to build that network, you know, um, and uh, take every opportunity that comes your way. Business of Architecture UK, episode 48. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am in South London. I was actually in the offices of Sofram, which have been beautifully fitted out. I was really, I was really, really impressed with their meeting room. I took a few pictures of it. I like their choice of furniture and the colours and the textures, and it was really, really gorgeous. Um, and I was had the joy of speaking with Oliver Solway, uh, who is the director of Sofram, and he was telling me about how the practice from, I think they started around 1995, how they've grown, how they've morphed, how they've evolved, how they've weathered difficult economic climates, how they've been involved in a number of different types of projects. I mean, the practice now is, you know, they work on things from sculptural interiors to hospitality, commercial, cultural, as well as large scale retail projects. Um, And they've also worked with some of the biggest commercial projects brands in the world alongside with some grand public institutions as well people like the British Museum the V&A Eurostar Virgin Atlantic um, and they've you know they've got a plethora of awards and I remember um, Sofram from when I was at university and some of their some of their super sexy slick images that they were producing for wallpaper and some of their more experimental architectural work in the Kilda Forest so it was a real delight to be there and to actually to hear the story of how they've gone about winning work, how they have grown the practice into what it is now. And there's absolute loads of gold nuggets here about entrepreneurship and um, and growing a business. So sit back and relax. And I know actually most of you are not actually sitting down. Most of you have told me that a lot, I know a lot of people, when you're listening to these podcasts, you're actually on your bicycle. So sit back and cycle and uh Enjoy Oliver Solway of Sofram. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I'm sitting down with Oliver Solway, Director of Sofram Architects. So welcome to the show, Oliver. Thank you. Very Um, nice to meet you. Pleasure to finally speak with one of my heroes (laughs) as a a student. I was all over your work. Absolutely loved the conceptual work that you were doing, the Kilda Forest project. you know, some of the, you know, the conceptual things you were doing, the wallpaper, very, very inspi- inspiring. And you're also... Thanks, that's very good to know. You're also Bartlett graduates as well. Bartlett graduates indeed, yes. So we've, we've got that in common. We do. Fantastic. We do. <clears throat> so you guys started practice around 95, you were saying. That's right. And how? Because you, you came straight out of uni. We did. So, I mean, the story there is you've got to cast your mind back that this was... So it was 95 when we started, so the UK was still there was still quite a big, essentially, recession going on. So there wasn't an awful lot of architectural work out mm. there. 
Um, <clears throat> but what had happened was that in our um, final years uh, at UCL, at the Bartlett School of Architecture, um, there'd been a big swing towards conceptual work because yeah. there'd been the arrival of um, Sir Peter Cook, uh, who'd obviously really shaken things up and made the school the amazing place it is today. Um, but right at the beginning of that point, there was a real sort of sense that if you put a building in your portfolio, you know, what were you doing, you idiots? <laughs> uh, but, you know, with the background of recession, we were sort of conscious that we wanted to at least have something that looked like a building <clears throat> to be able to show to people. Mm. So four of us teamed up and we entered um, a big international competition at the time, which was to design a new opera house for Cardiff. Right. Wow. And it was an open international competition, and um, but there was a kind of two stages to it. So they pre-selected four big names, which I think was OMA, Foster, uh, Raphael Maneo, and uh, A another, I can't quite remember. <clears throat> and then they had four spaces that could be openly pitched for. And amongst those four was the eventual winner, Zaha Hadid, um, but also ourselves, our little team of students. And uh, as a result of that, <clears throat> you needed to go to a next round of competition where you needed to, you know, deliver a fairly fully resolved scheme. So we set up a little office um, to do that together um, and did our competition entry. We didn't win. Um, I sometimes speculate what our lives might have been like if we had one, <laughs> probably very different, um, maybe not better. Um, <clears throat> but um, that gave us a taste for working together. And it proved that we that was something that we could do. And it also gave us confidence in what we produced, because mm. to, to be a bunch of students and produce work that you're then suddenly up against Foster and OMA and Zaha was a pretty amazing experience. So though we didn't win, we finished our diplomas, um, and then there was a year where we all worked. In fact, one of our number went off to um, uh, Bali and never came back. Right. Um, and the rest of us were, were in London. <clears throat> and so um, after working for a year, um, we had the opportunity to set up an office. Um, now, I had been working, I did my year out, and then worked during my diploma for Ron Arad. Um, who is a very famous furniture designer and architect. Um, and I worked first on the Tel Aviv Opera House project, which was an amazing job. But that was all drawn by hand. Right. Um, it was a very complex three-dimensional form, but um, we were drawing on, you know, tracing paper with rope rings and so forth. And, um, but... As part of that, they'd used, they'd gotten, I think, like one of the big engineering companies, could have been Arab, had given them the opportunity to do a 3D model of the project. And that started the ball rolling in terms of Ron Arad's getting interested in computer-aided design. And I had <clears throat> computer skills myself. Um, so what ended up happening was um, Ron had moved all of the furniture production that he mm. used to have in two workshops underneath his studio in Chalk Farm. He'd moved that out to Italy. Right. So he had two empty spaces. And so we did a deal whereby we did uh, computer imaging work and helped them computerize their office in return for not paying rent, but having a studio space, which was a great, you know, great advantage, um, great um, situation to be in. So we set up, we had the opportunity to set up an office. We had the opportunity to do that before we actually had a company. Right. So then it was okay, right, now let's form a company. Um, but um, it was obviously a challenging economic environment. Like I said, it wasn't like there was bags of work out there. Um, so we sort of structured our income that, you know, part of it was doing the work for Ron. Um, Chris Baggett, my business partner now, um, at that time was working for Rick Mather Architects. Right. And Rick Mather himself had gone through a situation of change in his practice where they had up until a certain point, been doing one-off restaurants and private houses and so forth. And suddenly he made the jump into doing university camp, a campus extension, mm. you know, some mega projects. Um, but obviously he was still getting inquiries for residential work. So what he had very effectively was a network of ex-employees that he trusted who he would pass these pieces of work on to and so um, we got a, a house remodeling job in Hampstead out of that <clears throat> so we got a bit of income in that way 
And then the third thing was that um, we set up to use our computer imaging skills to sell that as a service to other architects and designers. Right, okay. Because you've got to remember that back in 95, it wasn't the case. It wasn't the case that everybody was drawing on computers. Yeah. And it certainly wasn't the case that anyone was working in 3D on their desktop normally. It was very much a specialist thing. Yeah. So they were the glory days of um, computer imaging as a service. I wouldn't like to do that job now. Yes. It's so demanding, you know, and the level of quality and expectation of the clients is so high yeah. um, that it's become a very, very skilled, you know, profession in yeah. its own. Yeah, it's an industry in, in and of itself. Exactly. Yeah. At that time, it wasn't. And you could, I mean, the tools were much cruder then anyway. Mm. Um, and if you look back at the work that we did, you know, it's fairly basic. But at the time, it seemed sort of revolutionary to people. So um, we actually had quite a good... Um, work stream to supplement our income from doing that. You know, other people might have taught or they might have, you know, done other, I had other ways of um, supplementing income, but that was our model. So a bit of work for the landlord, a bit of CGI for external sources and a bit of hand-me-down work yeah. was what got us going. And and did that provide you an opportunity to kind of start doing your own research-based projects or how did, because you, you you, at that point you, you were quite well-known they're doing very conceptual work. Well, th- that's that's the interesting thing. So we were a fledgling little outfit, um, fresh out of college, <clears throat> um, but we got an amazing break to be able to expose our work to the world, uh, which was because we were offering computer imaging services, um, uh, a girl that we knew who was working at uh, Richard Rogers at the time uh, and a friend of hers who was working on the then startup magazine Wallpaper, um, they, um, in the very first issue of Wallpaper, they'd got a lady from SOM who had done what they called their dream pad, uh, which was a sort of modernist um, villa. Um, And it had been um, hand-drawn, you know, hand-drawn perspectives. Very beautiful. But um, the wallpaper wanted for the next one, which they commissioned from Jenny Jones, the the lady who was at Rogers, um, they wanted a townhouse and they wanted a computer illustrated. She knew one of our number. And so we were asked to um, give a very competitive fee quote to do the visuals of that design, Mm. which we did. Um, But... um, We managed somehow or other to persuade Wallpaper that the next one they should let us do, both the design and the images of, um, which we did, which we did this sort of project that was a a sort of fantasy fold-out pen knife that you could, giant pen knife that you could stick in an old office space and turn it into an apartment. Um, And it was a, it was a big hit. And it then led on that they commissioned six or seven other projects. They basically, it became our slot in the magazine for a you know, run of six or seven issues. And that magazine was going through its sort of amazing expansion phase. And so, our, as I said, the work of, you know, some unknown kids from London was shown all the way around the world. Mm. And because of the computer imaging, you were able to show something that looked much more tangible than we had the opportunity to produce by that mm. point. So that was just, that was an amazing lucky break I yeah. think, for us, really. Do, do you think there's an equivalent of that now? Um, well, I wonder. I suppose, would it be in traditional media like a magazine? Probably not. It'd mm. probably be somewhere else. So whether that's, you know, via social media or the web, or and also because the technology has moved on, is it now virtual reality stuff rather right. than static CGI that would be the thing? Maybe. So yeah. I think there is a there is a definite opportunity there for architects to sort of mm. grab. Yeah. And so you had the so you started to get kind of a lot of exposure. Yeah. And did that naturally lead to inquiries for work? It or? did. It did. I mean, uh, <clears throat> what it made us was sort of flavor of the month for a little while. Yeah. So um, not only we were doing stuff for wallpaper, we did did fan, you know, concept work for Vogue and for Time magazine in America, and you know a whole raft of people. And obviously, there are clients out there who are always looking for the next big hot thing. Mm. So what that led to directly was that um, Virgin Atlantic had at that time quite a visionary design department <clears throat> led by a chap called Joe Ferry um, and an architect, senior architect called Hilary Clark. And so we got a, 
we got an inquiry for them saying, can we come and meet you and just sort of have a chat, which we did. But then it was about six months later that they first asked us to pitch on something. And we didn't know what it was going to be. And I thought that if it was the the toilets at Heathrow, I would be happy. (laughs) When we discovered that it was the interior of the 747, it was like, oh my God, that's the dream project. An extraordinary opportunity. Um, And so um, that was, you know, we were lucky to win the pitch and ended up designing, uh, being part of a team that delivered this incredibly revolutionary aircraft interior, which is still flying to this day, nearly, you know, over a decade or more later. Mm. Um, And um, so, so that then was our real first step into that bigger league, because then you're in a situation where there's, you get an iconic brown like Virgin, and then everybody else is looking at them. Mm. So the ripple effect in terms of client commissioning uh, really spread out from there to a big de- degree. Right. And then, and then what was the nature of the work after that? that well, it really varied. So, I mean, in terms of the... the and when was this? This was sort of early 2000s? Uh, this would be, uh, this was 1989. Right, okay. Something like that. Um, and, um, it, it, the, obviously it raised our profile and it also gave, um, some of our, the people that might recommend us for things a bit more confidence in doing that. So, um, we actually had some quite good contacts at the VNA already. Um, and, um, so, uh, we were put on shortlists to do a pit for a couple of projects there. Mm. Um, which we won two really incredible jobs uh, from. One was the Jamil Gallery of Islamic Art and the other was the Education Centre. So that really propelled us into the cultural sector by by hook or by crook. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of interest from sort of um, smaller operators like restaurateurs and stuff like that, and that, was, that, that opened some doors. Um, but it was probably not until we did our second project with Virgin that really the floodgates opened a little bit. So um, Virgin were in a situation where they had the opportunity to take the site next door to their current, um, their, their, their then uh, business class lounge mm. at Heathrow um, and uh, expand into it and then um as a phased project, then refurb their existing space, join them together and have one new mega lounge space. And they knew that um, British Airways had just been given the whole of Terminal 5. So they really needed to make a splash as their home base. So they were, you know, quite up for doing something unusual and extraordinary and expensive. Mm. Um, And so it wasn't a shoe in that because we'd done the plane, we would necessarily get the lounge. We had to pitch for it again, go through that process. Well, what what was that? What was involved in that kind of process? Um, It, um, well, Virgin um, have a quite, or had developed quite a sort of well-crafted pitch process in terms of what helped them. And actually their methodology in some ways is a core part of what we still do right so everything is grounded in a business case and um, research about the customer needs um, and um, you had to sort of you know identify the opportunities and the challenges of what you were doing but it was all about coming up with a guiding vision mm. that could be clearly articulated in words to a board of directors who don't necessarily have an interest in architecture And once you've got them sold on that vision, then you develop the design in accordance with the values that structures that you've set up in that way. So they they sort of, in the pitch process, they would ask for a bit and then a bit more and then a bit more. So it was a multi-stage pitch process before you delivered a sort of design proposal. Yeah. Um, But uh, yeah, so very, very happily, we're in a lucky situation to, to win that. Um, so they didn't have any kind of framework agreements for no. where they worked over that time? No, 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 no. I mean, the funny thing is that when we, so we were working simultaneously with Virgin Atlantic and the Victorian Albert Museum at that point. Right. And the people at the VNA said, oh, it must be so different working with people like Virgin. They must be so organized. And you go, well, not really. And then you speak to Virgin, you say, oh, it must be so different working with people at the VNA. They must be so organized. Like, well, no, you're, you're both great, <laughs> but you're both as you know, in the same situation. You both have the similar operational structure. both have a similar <laughs> operational structure. And also, which is probably, 
I think quite telling is that they were actually in both of those situations, although they're big companies mm. or big institutions, there's quite a small core executive decision making team or there were then. Um, so actually they were pretty nimble in how they operated and could reach decisions quite quickly. Mm. And in both cases, there were people who had strong design backgrounds. So they were pretty um, informed, tasteful clients. Right. Okay. Sense. And how big was the office at this point? Um, well, the Virgin Project did force us to expand quite a bit. So at that point, uh, where by the time we were fully engaged on that project, we'd actually moved twice from our original base in uh, Ron Arrington Chalk Farm. So we moved initially to Soho. Uh, we had a great few years in Lexington Street in Soho. <clears throat> at the same time, our neighbours were Tomato, who were an incredible graphics company across the road. And, you know, it was a really exciting time. And um, so at that point in Soho, we were, there was probably about six of us. We moved to then to Oxford Street um, and we had a, a you know, decent sized space and we had about um, 10 core staff. But at the peak of the Virgin Project, we were up to about 16 or so people right. to deliver that because we were doing the V&A stuff simultaneously. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, yeah, so that was a sort of it was a it was fairly organic growth at that point. Did you ever kind of sit down together as a group of partners and develop like a business plan and be like, right, this is the this is the type of projects that we want to be moving into. These are the types of things. I think we probably had unspoken ambitions, but um, what we were very lucky at that point in, we were still at the point where we were still hot. Everything we pu published got a lot of publicity, so the work kind of found us rather than the other way around. Yeah. And um, we were refreshingly indiscriminate about what we took on. So we weren't saying, okay, we're going to target the aviation sector or you're going to target this. Sector. It just sort of happened quite organically. But what you also realise quite quickly is that it was actually quite... So we did think that because we'd done an aircraft interior for Virgin and because we'd done their lounge, then naturally there was going to be a whole load of other similar clients out there and there aren't because most of the airlines don't have design departments or don't have any meaningful design department they don't have any strong pattern of commissioning design mm. so we went knocking on the doors of people but they were just not particularly it wasn't that they were not receptive they just weren't geared up to commission in that way i think there are a few exceptions people like lufthansa are pretty clued up in terms of design and we've done various sort of um, yeah. things um with them. It kind, of, it kind of illustrates as well what sort of unique company Virgin is in that sector. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And this was the sort of white heat moment of Virgin because they, they, they'd expanded to become really a fully fledged airline mm. <clears throat> from nothing. Um, and, um, you know, they'd got their in-house team set up and all of that, but they hadn't yet, you know, now they've got they're in partnership with Delta. I'm sure things operate very differently, and they've you know they've been through some really tough times economically mm. since then. Um, but but back then, back in the day, there was a real sense of excitement and confidence. Yeah, got it. And so after the after the lounge project and the kind of looking around for other sort of airline craft yes. projects, then what? So the unexpected um, move then was the move into the world of shopping centres. Right. As you do. So what had happened was, what was great about the Virgin Project, or one of the great things about the Virgin Project, was what a calling card it was. Yeah. Because um, apart from it being published, what you have in those spaces is you've got a lot of high net worth individuals, CEOs and so forth, who pass through it. And in their busy schedules, they fun suddenly find themselves with half an hour to appreciate their surroundings, which are ours. And they've got something in mind and they think, well, why aren't these guys on my people's tendering list or whatever? Let's get them involved. And um, so it transpired that... Um, that's, that, that's a brilliant... I love that. It's yeah. great. I mean, you know, you couldn't ask for a better, better, better sort of situation um, of exposure. And um, so by hook or by crook, uh, the, the team who were, had assembled to build Westfield London which was the first Westfield site out in Shepherd's Bush. Right. Um, had a situation where they had a strategy where they were going to make the heart of the, the, the space a real architectural showcase. So um, Zaha Hadid was going to design the cinema 
um, and various other people are going to do bits. <clears throat> um, and um, they had um, a big food court space which they wanted to be quite radical and different and important. And they had their own in-house team in Australia uh, who had been getting nowhere fast trying to do a mashup of our Virgin Lounge. Right. And I think they just went, well, why don't we get the people that actually design that to have a look at it? Yeah. So uh, we were invited to do a sort of parallel exercise while they were still doing theirs to do an alternative take. But of course, we were never going to repeat ourselves. And in a sense... If you want to make sure you don't get exactly the same thing as what's just been done, hire the same people. Because if they're any good, they won't want to repeat themselves. Mm. They will want to do something different. So we went off in a very different direction. So whereas all of you know the plan of the Virgin Lounge is quite angular, driven by column grids and stuff, this was very much more um, sort of uh, simple shapes and cur- simple curves and stuff. So visually different. Um, but you know, at the same time, it was what we delivered was quite an audacious solution um and um and so they picked ours over the over australian teams and built it um and then that became just as the virgin lounge had become an exemplar project in its sector the westfield uh balcony food court became exemplar and was looked at by all of the other shopping center people mm. around the world and so when when, when was this this, this was, was in about 2006 i think right I'm okay correct. and um uh, the um, the really oh, stop there for a moment. Um, what was I going to say? Um, that was an example of one it was looked at by everybody else. Um, yeah, so lots of other. So yeah, so ultimately you get a situation where again you've got a cycle of the work kind of breeding more work in its own right. Right. Um, and that, yes, yeah, so so Virgin and Westfield were both looked at as the sort of gold standard at that point. And the other thing that we were very kind of, um, you know, lucky, I suppose, if you like, was that in the end, the only bit of their great architectural master plan that they did was our bit. So the Zaha bit never got done, the other bits never got done. So we were and still are the sort of most interesting visual visual bit in that yeah. shopping centre, which was a great um, great uh, coup for us in that sense. And, and projects like the, the Kilda Forest project, these were yeah. sort of... Yeah, so... That was quite a bit earlier. That's right, it is earlier. But um, the, the what that touches upon is the, the dual nature of our practice. Yeah. So... Um, we're an architectural practice. We have trained architects. Um, the two of us who are founders, you know, studied architecture. Um, but um, the majority of our work by turnover these days is interiors. Right. Um, but we still have architectural ambitions, and so there is a, in in parallel to the story of wallpaper, virgin, and what have you breeding in the interior side of the business. Uh, we were still and are still pursuing our architectural goals. And having done the wallpaper projects, um, which were fun and conceptual and so forth, we kind of felt, or I personally felt, a sense of um, we really need to prove that we can do this for real, that we can actually build stuff that still has some of those qualities that can translate from the page. Otherwise, you know, it's too easy. Yeah. Um, and so we were always looking for opportunities to to do that. But you can never be sure which the big opportunity is going to be in some ways. It doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the obvious ones. So um, we got an inquiry um, from uh, the Kielder Forest Partnership, who manage uh, public access to the Kielder Forest National Park up in Northumberland. Yeah. And they were on a mission to promote sustainable tourism in the area. Um, And so they were commissioning um, a series of artworks um, to be scattered around the Kiel de Forest Reservoir that would create then a trail for people to go and explore. And um, the first piece that they'd done was a James Turrell um, sky space. Um, and then they would, and that had given them the idea that maybe the things shouldn't just be artworks, but should have an architectural component to it. So they went out for the next one, they went out to architects and, um, they didn't have very much money. 
Um, there wasn't even the time or the money to go on the site visit up to Northumberland. So they just sent us a couple of panoramic photographs of possible sites and a map. Um, and um, we picked the, 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 the site based on it having the best name. Benny Shank was great. You know, I can't remember <laughs> what the other one was called. Um, and um, we set about creating a little um, thing that was sort of part artwork, part architecture. Um, that could go there and uh, and be functional as well as artistic in that it actually serves as a waiting point for a ferry that crosses the reservoir. Um, and so we built that for a very limited budget. It was um, less than 50,000. Um, and it only was going to have a design life of a few years, mm. but it's still very much there many years later. And it, it really kind of managed to, grab attention um, and so um, you know Condé Nast Traveller called it one of the ten wonders of the modern world which is not bad for your first building <laughs> and yeah, um, happy with that very happy <laughs> and it was put on the short list for the Sterling Prize um, and again you know for your first building to be a Sterling Prize nominee was pretty amazing especially for something so tiny yeah. and cheap um, and um, so uh, we didn't win the Sterling Prize, but it did win the first ever Stephen Lawrence Prize mm. for, the, for the best small building, um, which was, um, you know, a, a great opportunity. And so that sort of started our trajectory back towards architectural practice in parallel with the interiors stuff. Mm. Um, and again, another very sort of high profile publicity wise that's right project. that's right and um the other thing was that at the time um this was pre the, the 2008 2009 financial crisis um all of the big players in architecture were happily getting work around the world so the sort of uk competitions um uh market was a little bit more open than it is today. Yeah. Um, so because we had the history of having done the Cardiff Opera House competition, we knew that competitions were a good sort of method of operation. And so we entered a number of um, RIBA and other competitions and um, were very, very privileged to, to win on a number of occasions. So we won a project to do um, a footbridge in uh, Merseyside. Um, over the Leeds Liverpool Canal, um, <clears throat> and uh, we won a big international competition to build a new country house, a sustainable country house hotel up in um, the Midlands. Well, what do you think your kind of keys to being able to win competitions? Well, I, it's is... an interesting question, isn't it? Because what was interesting about those is that although you know, having done things like Cardiff and Kielder before, with those competitions, they were anonymous. Right. You could have no identification on the <clears throat> boards of who you were. There were no reference images of previous work that you've done. So people were coming into it fresh each time. So the fact that we won three of those big competitions must mean something. Mm. And I think it's down to um, a certain, obviously, qualities of the design, but also skill in communication. Um, the... The, the big thing about the wallpaper projects and part of the motivation behind doing those in the first place was that they were a reaction to the world of Liebeskind and Zaha, whose main intent then, before they really built stuff, was to sort of create a level of in mystique and intrigue about their work that made it impenetrable. Yeah. Whether that was through impenetrable drawings or impenetrable descriptions of them, they weren't really meant to engage the general public. They were to appeal to your peers in academia. Mm. And we were trying to be the antithesis of that in a sense. So we were trying to say, well, is there a way of communicating some quite sophisticated concepts, architectural concepts, to a general reader or viewer who's just flicking through the pages of a magazine. So you've got to hook people in with yeah. quite arresting imagery yeah. and then have interesting concepts to back it up. Um, so I think that was part of the success because we continued to create, you know, great looking boards for those presentations. But also we're real pragmatists. Mm -hmm. So uh, for us, it's not good enough for something just to look good. It's got to really function well. And so we always matched the sort of visionary aspect of it with real kind of practical 
function, clever planning, sensible use of materials, you know, sustainable energy strategies. So I think that was probably the the, the mix that that provided that success. Right. And so and so around two thousand and eight, how did you did you guys yes. experience Absolutely. So um the, the two thousand and eight kind of signaled the death knell of our architectural careers at that point for a number of years. Right. Because so we'd been getting successful in the competitions and we entered another RIBA one, <clears throat> which was to extend a university campus uh, on the Welsh border, Glyndwr University, with four blocks of student accommodation and a and a and a, um, a sort of uh, common facilities centre, and that was a thirty million pound project, and um, and we won. Um, and um, we, they, as part of that, they then insisted that we get our team in place to deliver it, which we did. So we hired a load of staff um, and got feasibility in. And then they turned around and said, oops, we'd invested all of our money in Iceland and it's all gone. So um, that wow. project was just completely wiped out by the financial crisis. And as a result, we found ourselves with a team of people that we then had to let go. Um, How many people? Were uh, well, so we got up to the sort of 15, 16 point, and then we were back down to six or seven, yeah. you know, rattling around in our office. I say rattling around, but what saved us was that the interiors work was just getting bigger and bigger. So whilst right. you had the, the, the grinding to a halt of the architecture side of it, the Westfields and the Virgins and the like of that were still walking through the door. So it was very easy to switch focus and stay afloat. Yeah. Um, so definitely a lesson there is as much as you can spread your bet, as it were, you know, that's definitely a... a so it's, it's, it's quite interesting because you've, you've gone for a, a process where, yeah, you've, you've diversified in the typology of work that you're doing. And I suppose from a marketing perspective, it's very, it can be quite difficult yes. sometimes if you're a generalist. Yeah. How, how do you kind of resolve that? Okay, so the, the, conflict? The, the, the conflict is that people tend to only think of you in the way that they first come to know you. So if they come to know you as an architect, they're going to give you architectural work. If they come to you as an interior person, they're going to just assume that that's the limit of what you do. Mm. So we've always been very careful to stress that in terms of our interiors work, they are um, architecturally designed interiors. They are um, interiors that, um, you know, so we won't just, we're not just about putting up curtains and cushion fluffing. We will, in, we will look at changing the structural grid. We will work with the base build architects to replan the mechanical surfaces to make it work. So there's that architectural mm. interface, but also in parallel with that, we've developed the sensibilities of the interior side of it, which I don't think is something that comes necessarily naturally to architects who are scared of color quite often. They're scared of, or or if they're not scared of color, they'll just put in every bright color they can think of. There's no subtlety and sophistication to it. Whereas yeah. if you look at interior designers, or good interior designers work, there'll be a real eye. Yeah, yeah. That work there. So we tried to build up that, but bolted to that architectural knowledge and sensibility. So, um, so that's one way of trying to sort of defuse the thing. But the other is to just run with it and say, okay, yeah, you see us as interior people, just give us more interior work, that's fine, and we'll get our architectural yeah, work and, from and those, somewhere else. Yeah, and those two clients don't need to talk to each other no, anyway. So you no, can, exactly. You, you can kind of keep communicating where interiors yeah. over here, where yeah. architects to, this, to right. this client as well. That's right. But it's interesting, so we're just going through a rebranding process at the moment, mm. and... Um, uh, I was conscious that we needed to explain. I gave my business card to someone fairly major the other day and he looked at it and he saw the name and he looked at it and he, in just a bit of confusion, said, so what do you do? And I said, oh, well, we're architects and we do interiors. And so that suddenly made me think, well, actually, maybe we need to put the words architecture and interiors on our website and business cards just to make it really quite clear. Yeah. Um, but then you get into really complex things, which we've been working with our graphic designers Praline about, which is, is it architecture slash interiors? Is it architecture plus interiors? Is it architecture and interiors? And we've gone for a long line that connects to it. So it's architecture, <laughs> long line, interiors. So they're sort of, you know, buddies and part of the same thing, but we acknowledge that they're slightly different in a way. Um, which gives people the flexibility to see us in one way or another, depending on what they're coming to us to find. Yeah. 
And how do you mark, how do you win? How are you winning work now? Does it still a kind of referral basis or people coming to you in projects or how do you like proactively go? And yeah. Do? So um, back in the day, the routes would either have been the work comes to you or you do a competition. But after 2008, 2009, the competition scene totally changed and mm. changed in two, well, three ways. One was suddenly all of the major players like Zaha's and Foster's and Grimshaw's were entering the competition to design a public toilet in Wakefield, you know, because everybody needed turnover, everybody needed. So you were suddenly out of the picture for all of those. Also, there was um, a big rise in um, the, reducing risk in competitions. So they would expect you to be able to produce sets of accounts going back 10 years and, you know, you had to be able to turn over a certain size and that sort of ruled a lot of people, the smaller players mm. out. Uh, and thirdly, there was the rise of the sort of professional project manager, competition organiser type who um, obviously are there to represent the client's interests, but really they're there to beat up the poor architectural contestants. And it just became not a very nice sort of environment to mm. operate in. So we ditched that for a long time. It's only We've only gone back to it really in the last year or so, doing right. the open competition. Um, so most of it was referral, but we know that that's not something that you can rely on. So um, what we are focusing more and more on is about... Um, Mark, proactive marketing and um <clears throat> you know uh, uh, and there the current strategy is about creating awareness of who we are in particular sectors um and geographical territories mm. uh with the intention that over the longer term that pays off in terms of uh, people coming to find you and what, and what sort of strategies have you been employing so um obviously there's things like doing um thought leadership pieces podcasts um, and um, and we're doing some pro bono work uh, for people um, and doing some work with people like the NHS at the moment. Right, okay. Um, so really trying to um, find ways into different sectors. Uh, and also we've had, um, we've met, we've had, we've sort of made sort of beachheads in various different places globally. So we've sort of landed um, quite often with an amazing key client mm. in that territory. Um, and then it's about, well, finding, well, who else is out there in that particular region and exploring that. So we are, <clears throat> um, we became part of the UK, what was then the UK Trade and Industry Creative Task Force, which is a group of um, businesses in the design sector, but across all sectors of design, who the UK uh, government will help you in um, finding ways to export right, and showcase okay. you. So um, we we did some work a couple of years ago. We got an inquiry out of the blue from South Korea. Um, I was really busy at the time and I didn't pay it too much attention because we'd, we'd also had quite a few sort of inquiries that went nowhere from Russia and from Poland and from the Middle East. So I just took it as another one of those. Uh, didn't really research the client, which I normally do very thoroughly. Put in a fee bid that we thought was quite high and then found we got the job. <laughs> and still were really busy. So went out to see them um, and um, got there and was like, oh my God, these are really important people. <laughs> this is an amazing project. Wow, wow. Um, so, um, uh, so, so we did some work there. And um, as a result of that, we're now looking with the UK, um, uh, British Chamber of Commerce, for example, in, in Korea, um, at you know, how we can you know, expand that market. But again, mm. it goes back a little bit to the Virgin Airline thing. You can't necessarily assume there's going to be hundreds of other clients that are... Yeah. As, visionary or open to foreign commissioning from foreigners so it's going to be an interesting thing there you, you said that you you often research the clients very yeah. thoroughly what, yes. what, why why do you do that and what sort of process do you go through well first of all i mean very simply finding out what the company structure is you know who they are so if we'd done our research properly for example on the Seoul career project uh, we would have discovered that Shinsuke, who were the client there, um, are the sort of quality level of uh, Harvey Nichols. So amazing. Um, and they're also um, uh, part of the same family ownership as Samsung. 
So they are like one of the biggest families in Korea. So that's a part. And then you un- try to understand what the sort of culture of the, well, culture of the, the nation, obviously, but also the culture of the client is um, whatever you can learn about what they've commissioned before and who they commissioned from and how that's gone and what quality aspirations they've done. And also um, just then um, very simply, before you go to a meeting, at least look look up on LinkedIn who you're meeting, <laughs> whether they're male or female, which you may not be able to tell from their name in a foreign country. Um, and, you know, also, you know, you may find out that the person you're going to speak to who's now in-house at a department store mm. spent 20 years working in the architectural sector for multiple big practices. And so you then can have a much more informed discussion yeah. Them. So it's just about doing your homework. I mean, it's just diligent, really. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So that's and, generally what we try and do. Brilliant. And so, and sort of wrap up. What would be your advice be to young startup practices? You know, fresh out of university. Yeah. They're keen. They've kind of you know they're look, they're looking towards you guys as like inspiration. Like what 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 advice would you give? Those um, kinds of practices. Well, it's depending on whether you think people should follow the model that we followed, which has worked for us. But there's been a lot of luck involved in what we've done. Things that have gone our way that might not have done. Mm. Obviously, there are things that have gone against us uh, equally. But um, what I would generally say is that, you know, until there's going to be some people who will be setting up a practice because they've worked for someone else for 10 years and that person has been a specialist in healthcare and so now they will have some healthcare contacts which they will work that sector and they'll build their business that way obviously that's a route but if you're starting out without those connections and that network i think the first thing is is to to build that network you know um and uh, take every opportunity that comes your way a mm. little bit at least in the beginning mm. i know that there's advice about you know, you know the the clients you should say no to, and da, 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 but not when you're starting out, really. And that, I mean, obviously, you you don't want to you want to avoid the dodgy ones, but that's down to diligent research. Um, but um, you know, we couldn't have predicted what doing a rendering for somebody else for wallpaper would have led to. We couldn't have predicted what doing a little competition in a public arts project would have led to. Mm. Um, uh, uh, but and then seizing every opportunity to go and speak somewhere or um, you know uh, or write something or you know just do everything you can to establish you know yourselves and in a sense it's what we still do now but just on a kind of larger and slightly more connected scale I suppose and I think the other bit of advice I would give someone was the advice I was given which is before you start your business take a holiday because you probably won't for years otherwise <laughs> and that's been absolutely the case <laughs> it was probably like six years after starting that I took a two week holiday and have rarely done so since so yeah get a bit of a break get a bit of break because it's going to be a slog <laughs> brilliant excellent Oliver thank you so much for your time today you're very welcome thank lovely you. to speak to you thank you So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.